nonviolent civil disobedience training to their current highly developed and relevant mandate to publish books for nonviolent, progressive, transformational social activism. Out of their beautiful headquarters surrounded by an orchard and chickens and dogs and an orange cat, New Society publishers are leaders in the field of sustainability and building community. In an industry that often seems to be in a state of hand-wringing and crisis, they have been remarkably nimble, they have brilliantly embraced new technologies, they have hired and kept the most fabulous employees, and they have stayed true to their remarkable vision. Tonight we'll hear the inspiring story of Chris and Judith Plant. The story is full of love and passion, heroism and commitment, intelligence and generosity and resilience. It is my honor as a Gabrielan, as a fan and admirer and friend, to welcome one of my heroes, Judith Plant. Thank you, everybody. It's just a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I can't believe how many people have come. I'm so honored by each and every one of you to your presence. It's just uh, it's uh, slightly overwhelming. <laughs> Um, I'm very grateful to be here today to share my story with you. Before we begin, I just want to say one thing, and that is uh, Gerhard uh, Eckelberger from Friesens, who we partnered with on the paper initiative, is here today. And really, we couldn't have done that paper initiative without the commitment of Friesens. And so I would just ask if Gerhard would please stand up and take a little applause, because really, uh, he's here somewhere. Thank you, thank you. He's over there. You know, these big things that we do in the world, it's not really, it's, it always takes a bunch of us, doesn't it, really? <laughs> we can't ever do anything really on our own. Okay, I'm very grateful to be here today to share our story with you. It wouldn't be possible without, without the many, many people who have come before me and who stand beside me now. As I will briefly talk about, New Society Publishers has a deep history one that began in Philadelphia in 1971, long before Kip and I emerged on the scene. Kip and I have been involved for almost 25 years since 1990. We've had the privilege of work that has been inspiring, engaging, challenging, and always interesting. This is our part of the NSP story. But if we've done our job well, our story is tangled up with many other people's. In some ways, NSP books are a cultural expression of the peace, the feminist, the communitarian, the environmentalist, the social justice movements, and many more over the decades, and so reflect the lives of many of us. For Kip and I, the telling of our story at this particular time in our lives probably means more to us than even we can imagine. Creating this presentation has asked us to go back in time to pull together the threads of our 35 years of life together and especially the last 30 years of working together for social change. It is a poignant time for us personally as we deal with perhaps the greatest challenge we've ever faced. I also believe that it is a crucial time in our collective story of freedom and resistance to oppression. It's no accident that we live and work on Gabriola Island, for we have known for many years that Gabriola is one of BC's rich pockets of resistance. We feel lucky indeed. <laughs> no words could ever express. <laughs> I think I have Kleenex here. The love and gratitude I have for Kip, my life partner. Editors rarely get they rarely get the appreciation they deserve. Kip is a brilliant publisher and a brilliant acquisitions editor. He kept the company on the cutting edge for years. Tonight he has made the great effort to be with us. Please give him a round of applause. tale. It is part love story, and I ask your indulgence for this. I couldn't tell it any other way. 
It is also political. How could it be otherwise in these times? From Kip's work for an independent and nuclear-free South Pacific as a young man, he learned from his mentors, and he later taught me, that our task as publishers is to enable others to be their catalyst. So sit back. It's storytelling time, and we have pictures. A more honorable beginning for a book publishing company would be hard to find. <clears throat> Our time to take the reins at New Society Publishers would be a good 10 to 14 years after the first broadsheets and pamphlets, and then the first bound book hit the streets. So my telling of the story of these early days comes from conversations primarily with David Albert, one of the founders of NSP and our mentor in this business. The Movement for a New Society, or MNS, the genesis of New Society Publishers, was a Quaker-based activist collective that began in 1971 as a response to the Vietnam War, and most likely was the foundation of the anti-nuclear movement in the US. MNS was a collective organized to facilitate trainings in nonviolent civil disobedience, a practice that no one really knew much about then, especially in the US. Following in the footsteps of the theory and practice of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, MNS would eventually acquire several old mansions in Philadelphia where folks would come and stay, setting up temporary communities while dedicating themselves to learning how to stand up collectively and nonviolently to the war machine in its many forms. Training materials were needed. Pamphlets were created with titles like Why Nonviolence and were distributed in quantities of 500 or so at a time and the whole operation was funded by donations. Over half a million copies of Why Nonviolence would eventually be in circulation. As David describes it, the collective was a book packing company, and out of this grew a book publishing company, quite the reverse of most other companies, publishing companies I know of. <clears throat> the first book, The Resource Manual for a Living Revolution, published in 1978, was known familiarly as the Monster Manual, most likely because it contained everything anyone needed to uh, transform society towards peace and nonviolence, and it was a one-of-a-kind publication. The newly formed book publishing collective knew nothing about book publishing and had little or no self-discipline, according to David. <laughs> they did know that the best way to sell books was to publish a bunch of them. So in the early 80s, they produced six books, funding them on advance sales. Joanna Macy's Despair and Personal Power in the Nuclear Age, Pam McAllister's Reweaving the Web of Life, and the Barbara Deming Reader most likely carried them the first few years. Reweaving probably sold about 30,000 copies. I bought one in 1982, and it changed my life, as NSP books tend to do. There is much, much more to tell about the origins of New Society Publishers, and I'm encouraging David Albert to write the full story for us, but I offer these tidbits just to set my own story in context. So how we got involved in, in more ways than one. I was 30, he was 29, I was a single mom with three kids. He had no money. <laughs> we met in the SFU library while hanging back on a rather dull but essential tour for new students. To distract ourselves from the tedium, we started talking, finding out quickly uh, that we were in the same department. Uh, communications. It was 1978, just a few years after SFU and the communications department had made history with its radical student movement, followed by the crushing, crushing reality of the dismissal as of most of the radical professors. I was most definitely not interested in a relationship that would upset my focus on the exciting adventure of returning to school. I had worked hard in Fort McMurray to save money to get me started and was anxious but energized. He pursued me for days. <laughs> <laughs> D-A-Z-E there. <laughs> As he approached me across the quadrangle, I said to a friend, this is it, I'm ditching this guy. <laughs> Instead, we went for coffee. I paid. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at my own joke. <laughs> and started to talk. My jaw dropped as Kip told me where he'd been the last seven years of his life. He had come to SFU on a Commonwealth scholarship and the money hadn't arrived yet to research the viability of satellite communication as a tool for the independence movements in the various tiny South Pacific countries, 
mostly in Melanesia and Micronesia. All of this was just the tip of the iceberg. Kip had been one of the primary organizers for the first nuclear free and independent Pacific movement conferences in the South Pacific, where nuclear bomb testing had already occurred with devastating consequences in Mororoa and the Marshall Islands. In addition to this, he was the personal aide and speechwriter for Walter Leaney, who was an Anglican priest from Pentecost Island, one of the outer islands of the group of many islands then known as the New Hebrides, and the leader of the independence movement, taking on both the French and English colonizers of that country. Father Leaney did succeed a few years later and became the first prime minister, renaming the islands Vanuatu, and Kip became his adopted brother. We didn't stop talking for a month. I had come from Fort McMurray, my own story was interesting enough, and I had reached remarkably similar conclusions as Kip had come to with his seemingly more worldly experience. I had worked at the Nistuayu Native Friendship Center. I was the only non-First non Nations person amongst many angry and dis disenfranchised people. I had been hired as executive director by a board of directors to clean up the books and get the organization back on its feet. No one talked to me for six months. I sat in my office and read. Aquasasni Notes, mostly, the radical newspaper from the Six Nations people, and Makara Magazine, <clears throat> a beautiful feminist journal from Vancouver. I learned a huge amount and, many of my, and had many of my assumptions about how the world worked turned upside down. Add this knowledge to the reality of my life, the ridiculousness of trying to raise and provide for three children in the tragic environment of Fort McMurray, and here was a recipe for personal change on a dramatic level. I knew there must be a better way to live, but I had no answer to this question. So it wasn't with the ambition of increasing my chances of a good paying job that I turned toward the university, but it was to seek answers to my problem. How could I change my life so that I could provide a healthy and sane world for myself and my kids? So too was Kip wrestling with this question, but his query came more from a political perspective how can we deal with a world that is colonized to the core? What can be done to alter this killing course? Our love story began here. Instead of being distracted by love, we were thoroughly inspired and engaged by endlessly discovering our common ground. But it wasn't until we met Fred Brown, one of the few radical professors left in our department, that things really took off for us, at least intellectually. Fred's life story is well documented elsewhere. I have one copy of his biography, a compass and a chart on the table. I understood little of what he said, not having done the decades of reading required to follow his scholarly thought, except from time to time I did get it. When he talked about community, about recreating culture, where people were willing to question their own individualistic and alienated <laughs> behavior. <laughs> Who could predict it, eh? <laughs> I, of all the things I worried about, I never... <laughs> anyway, anyway, so there we are. And instead asking us to act as if people really could decide together how best to make up a coherent group, like a tribe, but self-consciously organizing ourselves, this was the exciting stuff for Kip and I. Fred was in the process of leaving the university. Nearing retirement age and fed up with departmental politics, I should just say that Fred's daughter, Haida Brown, is here. So, yeah, Haida's here. Fred and his family and a few dedicated students were headed for the interior to settle on a piece of land, embarking on building the new world. Kip and I were finished our degrees, accepted into further graduate work, but we needed a break from the concrete world walls of SFU. I got a job in New Ianch, <clears throat> in Niska territory, 65 miles north of Terrace, and we were lucky enough to rent a trapper's cabin just outside the village. There we lived as a little family for two years, decompressing from the, from the city, but keeping in touch with Fred in the ongoing commune experiments. In the summer of 1983, Kip and I and our eldest daughter, Julie, went to visit Fred and friends at Camelsfoot, the 180-acre ranch nestled in the mountains, accessible only by a mountain trail in winter and a treacherous seven-mile road that took an hour to drive in summer. That was the commune's Shangri-La. 
They were beginning the massive task of installing a Pelton wheel hydroelectric system meant to generate enough power for a small village. Clearly, they needed our help. At least that was our excuse. And that was our excuse for embarking on an adventure that would actually change our lives forever. The day we arrived at Camel's Foot with all our stuff, piano, chickens, <laughs> books, toys, was also the day that Fred was given the news that he had terminal cancer. The next two years, though rarely an easy time, were precious. Suffice to say that once bitten by the idea of humans as social creatures <clears throat> and the vision of living together in caring and viable groups, there is no turning back. Our library at the foot was massive. Our conversations endlessly interesting. Well, in our day-to-day -day relations, that's where we were babes in the woods. <laughs> Fred died at the end of our first year, surrounded by community. The second year, things began to unravel. Kip and I, being relative newcomers, felt we needed to put some distance between ourselves and the tangled net of relationships our mentor had left behind. Luckily, we were able to acquire the property at the bottom of the trail, moving in with our eldest daughter and her boyfriend. We felt like refugees. We were broke and disenchanted. I had to leave my family that winter for a job in Vancouver. As luck would have it, I worked for Fed Up Co-op. <laughs> Fed Up Food Co-op. Kip and I had been members of Fed Up since SFU, like the Camel's Foot folks and Friends in Terrace and hundreds of others. Fed Up began in the early 70s, initially funded by a grant from the NDP government of $20,000, with members as far away, far away as the Yukon and all around the province who took turns, turns doing work weeks in the warehouse in Vancouver. Fed Up had been a real connecting force amongst the alternative back to the landers who wanted access to good quality bulk food. Twice a year, Fed Up put out a price list, a broadsheet with all the bulk items listed, order forms, etc. The center spread was the price list, and the other eight pages were get dedicated to news and views from member groups, each group taking a turn creating them. We called ourselves the Bridge River People, and like all the member groups, when it was our turn, we spent many days handcrafting these pages with art, poems, and pieces of writing. A whole publication was called the Catalyst, L-I-S-T, the list part being the price list. And I've got some of these, many of them, uh, on the back table, which are so much fun to look at. Sadly, but inevitably, Fed Up had, had to close its doors. Bulk food was now available in grocery stores, and most people in the regions gradually lost interest in doing work weeks in Vancouver. In fact, part of my job was to figure out what should be done with this languishing organization. Our little household, Kip and I and Julie and her then partner Kelly talked a lot about this when I would come back to the city. The valuable part to us was the kata part of the catalyst, that part that connected people. We were also struggling with forestry issues in the Bridge River and we knew others around the province must be in the same boat. We needed to stay in touch if only to share strategies. So we worked hard on a proposal to the Fed Up Board of Directors to keep the eight-page eight wraparound section of the catalyst, keep the membership list, and launch a new publication called the New Catalyst, L-Y-S-T. We made a bid for the $20,000 to use as seed money. Simultaneously, we asked for an explorations grant from the Canada Council for $12,000. After many tense meetings and a lot of tough questions, the board passed on the money and the Canada Council gave us the grant. We were launched. The new journal would be a project of the newly formed Catalyst Education Society and would be a voice for acting locally and thinking globally. The first issue, the state of the movement, fall 1986. And they're all back there. Gas was cheaper in those days and it was a good thing. We drove the couple of hundred miles with our floppy disk to Vancouver where baseline type and graphics, a, a cooperative business, turned it into columns of type. They also let us use their light tables and office space after hours. Kip and I often worked most of the night laying out the pages with sharp knives, glue, and line tape, delivering the finished product to the printer first thing in the morning. Next day, we picked up the hundreds of bundles of hot off the press new catalysts and delivered them by truck all around the city to bookstores, health food stores, anywhere that would take them, picking up the money from the sales of the last issue. And we drove home back up the Fraser Canyon to quickly send out the several thousand copies on the subscription list and bill the advertisers. Our living room turned into a post office as we bundled and sorted according to Canada Post's mailing system for bulk rate. 
We had hoped to produce six issues a year, but had to limit it to a quarterly. It was just too much. We partnered with Western Canada Wilderness Committee <clears throat> on one issue, printing 50,000 copies. The living room was a mail sorting room for a week. Our son conscripted into tying up and labeling bundles saying, I'm only 12 years old. <laughs> as we seemingly endlessly loaded up the one-ton community truck. Creating a new catalyst wasn't all we were doing. We were also homeschooling, growing and preserving lots of our food, including meat, eggs, milk, making cheese, defending our little valley from the constant threat of logging. The Stein Valley just down the road was a huge issue for us, as was the proposed toxic waste dump at Cash Creek, uh, where Vancouver's garbage would end up. We actually called it Trash Creek. All the time, we were continuing to rework our dream of community. The need to connect with others of like mind put us in touch with the bioregional movement. Such an awkward word, but elegantly written about by literary greats like Gary Snyder, Peter Berg, Wendell Berry, and then activists like Freeman House and others. Learning to live within the gifts and limitations of a particular place, creating a culture of place, these were ideas that were right up our alley. It was so exciting to connect with these folks. In 1986, I was invited to speak on ecofeminism and bioregionalism at the North American Bioregional Congress in Michigan. Four of us piled into our little car and drove there and back, sleeping under the stars as we made our way. I gave my talk to the several hundred folks gathered under the main tent. It was one of many presentations and events set over the next four or five days. And there were exhibits and tables and brochures and maps and a book table with a bold sign that said, please touch the books. <laughs> Here were titles like Power of the People, Keeping the Peace, We Are All Part of One Another, Reweaving the Web of Life, and so on. This was New Society Publishers, with Ellen Sawslack and David Albert, two of the NSP Collective, in lively conversation with people around the table. Based in Philadelphia, this was a publisher who went looking for its readers and writers, which was just what was going on. Alongside the table, a chair had been set up, an author's chair, for anyone who wanted to talk about a possible publishing project. Kip and I took turns in that chair. Kip had a book in his head on the peace movement in the South Pacific, Waves of Freedom. My topic was ecofeminism and bioregionalism. We talked on and off over the next few days, beginning a relationship with these folks and this organization that would stay with us for the rest of our lives, though we certainly didn't know it then. My book ended up being published by New Society Publishers in 1989. Healing the Wounds, The Promise of Ecofeminism was a book that I needed in my own life. And as it turned out, it fit the bill for many others too. And David and Ellen became friends. We collaborated with Eleanor Wright and Van Andrus, two of the original Camel's Foot folks who we had lived with during our two years on the commune to create a truly wonderful anthology called Home, a Bioregional Reader. It was around the development of this project, and no doubt the signing of the contract, that David and Ellen made a house call to Camelsfoot, walking up the long mountain trail, publishers that make house calls. <laughs> so now we had books and a magazine on the go, as well as everything else. We had a tiny turbo wheel on the creek that powered our Osborne computer that churned out the print for both of these projects. This power system worked well until the temperature hit seven below, and then nothing we could do would keep it going. While working on the ecofeminism issue of the new catalyst, the temperature dropped. Kip and I headed to the waterline with blowtorch in hand. It was futile. I remember thinking how ironic it was to be trying to keep this system going while crafting words about living within the gifts and limitations and ceasing to exploit <laughs> nature and <laughs> putting the battery in the truck and driving it around for a while <laughs> to charge it up worked in a pinch, but really, that felt antithetical to everything we stood for. <laughs> Communication beyond our hillside word factory was via a radio telephone with listening hours, using a simplex system, meaning that only one party could speak at a time while everyone else on the system could listen in on and to at least one side of the conversation. <laughs> we inquired with BC Tel about the possibility of a real phone line. $90,000 would be our share of the bill. And David Suzuki was pleading with the world that we only had a decade to turn things around. The turnaround decade, he was claiming, was a crucial window for making real change. 
At the same time, David and Alan were encouraging us to consider taking on more book projects, maybe even opening up, an, opening up a Canadian New Society Publishers. David muttered in our ears, you know, you would probably reach more people with books than a magazine. And relations in our household were deteriorating. Social life is so fragile, and we demand so much of each other and ourselves. Ours was an excessively busy life. Kip and I were full of ambition. Not everyone wanted or needed the same goals. After much hand-wringing conversation and some anguish, Kip and I decided to leave the Bridge River, but only for the turnaround decade, to see what we could do with our burgeoning publishing work and to see if we could help make a difference. And so it was. With books and magazines in hand, all our gear, all our hopes and fears, and every cent we could find, that we moved ourselves to Gabriola Island in 1990. Susan Yates sent us the loveliest letter, which I will never forget, receiving, please consider coming to Gabriola, she said, you'd like it here, or something like that. But I remember the note, it was lovely. Uh, and Laurie McBride, both Gabriolans and activists, encouraged us to come. We knew of Susan through the Gabriola Island Peace Association, and Laurie through her work with the Georgia Strait Alliance. Still in all, it was tough to leave the Bridge River, where our dreams of community and a new world had been born. But then, it was only for the next 10 years. <laughs> After much discussion with the whole New Society Publishers Collective in Philadelphia and a couple of trips to the city of brotherly love, we established a working relationship on what we loosely uh, described as a mutual aid agreement, borrowing from the gentle, Kropot gentle anarchist Peter Kropotkin's ideas that cooperation and mutual aid are the most important factors in the evolution of species and the ability to survive. That felt right to us. For a while, we continued to publish the new Catalyst, but it quick, quickly became apparent that we couldn't do both books in a quarterly magazine. The magazine soon morphed into books through the new Catalyst bioregional series, small volumes, 144 pages each, two a year. The first was Turtle Talk, Voices for a Sustainable F Future, which Kip and I edited. As, as we did the next several in the series, we produced nine in all, uh, the last being Our Ecological Footprint by Bill Reese and um, Mathis Wackenagel, which would become a signature book for the emerging Canadian New Society publishers. For five years, Kip and I operated a satellite office of New Society publishers from our tiny space between the house and the chicken coop. We made editorial decisions together with the Philadelphians, marketed and sold books to the Canadian trade, maintained an active direct mail business, but kept a separate set of financial books. Both organizations functioned under not-for-profit umbrella societies. In Philadelphia, the New, Ca the, the New Society Educational Foundation, and in Canada, the Catalyst Education Society. Kip and I traveled to England, met progressive publishers, booksellers, and writers and activists there. Some of these organizations had collaborated with NSP through the Philadelphia office, and some we hoped would in the future. In Canada, I visited Toronto uh, to try to convince a distributor to take us on. Not an easy task. These books were primarily American-centered. The Canada Council told us that the books had poor production values. In other words, the covers were boring. And the interior design was, well, maybe a little unprofessional looking. Uh, and the authors were eligible, were not eligible for grant money, <clears throat> being non-Canadian, and the subject matter was most definitely not literary. It was tough. Kip and I took turns being employed as there just wasn't enough money coming in from book sales to keep us both on the payroll. This didn't mean that we both didn't work. We did. We worked all the time. If we weren't actually cranking out words on the page, we were talking about it, strategizing, working on connecting the dots, uh, of the perceived need for activist materials, what would sell, how we could stay alive in the book publishing milieu. And we also grew a large garden and kept on expanding the office, as well as building a log cabin in the orchard, which would eventually become part of the NSP offices as well. Every year, we got together with the Philadelphians for an F2F, or a face-to-face. -face. It was a week of meetings, mostly in Philadelphia, though we hosted the whole gang on Gabriola once as well. During these meetings, we presented our financial statements, went over covers, decided on many details that we would work out better together than when apart. 
really. The fax, fax machine had only just been introduced. It was an amazing event when we could fax draft cover designs to each other, when prior to this, we actually had to mail these things between offices. It was during one of these F2Fs that it was revealed to the whole collective that things were not going well in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia organization was built on an interpretation of the Quaker model that held that everyone has a piece of the truth. Decision making went on and on and on. The collective sensibility and the need to have everyone feel included in an equal part of the company meant that people took turns in various roles within the organization. Everyone wanted to be an editor. Few wanted to do typesetting, and no one wanted to water the house plants. <laughs> Some folks had been at NSP for 10 years, others a few months. Some had years of activist involvement, others were young anarchists. Computer technology was relatively new. The bookkeeper, a kind and lovely soul, refused to computerize the financial data, doing everything by handwritten letters, ledgers, royalties, financial statements, budgets. Sales were down in 1995. America was saber rattling. It was a depressing time for peace activists and progressive book publishers alike. At this particular F2F, it was revealed that the organization was in financial difficulty. More than that, it appeared that money had been loaned to the organization that not everyone knew about. Paychecks were not being cashed by some, though unknown to the whole, so that the rest of the payroll could be met. The building that had been bought in more flush times needed serious repair and payments were overdue. On top of all this, the folks in the collective that had been with NSP for years were burnt out. They'd had enough and wanted to move on with their lives. It was a recipe for disaster, for collapse, actually. But Kip and I were not ready to pack it in. In, felt, in fact, we felt like we were just getting going. I remember clearly sitting in an airport lounge on the way home from that devastating F2F, and it dawned on us that if we could figure out how, we could probably end up with the entire New Society publishers under our wings. But how? We had lots of enthusiasm, but no money. As a not-for-profit, the Catalyst Education Society, the legal entity whose project was New Society Publishers in Canada, was originally mandated with terms that were political, i.e. world-changing in our opinion. Too political for the government to allow donors to deduct gifts from their taxes. Knowing this, Kip and I approached a fancy law firm in Vancouver to see if we could rewrite our terms of reference, making us friendlier to the CRA. The lawyer sent us back home with piles of work to do. Meanwhile, the Philadelphians were desperately trying to find a solution in the US, and some weren't sure they wanted new society to, to move to Canada. The pressure was on for us to, to find a way. <clears throat> uh, we, didn't, we didn't want to lose this potential opportunity. One afternoon, while pulling orders off the fax machine, out came our salvation. Some Nigerian chief had left, died and left us all his cash. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered sending books to Nigeria not long ago, and now all that shipping expense was paying off. All I had to do was send them our bank account details by return of fax. <laughs> Just as I was about to hit the send button with this essential information, it occurred to us that, well, maybe we should consult a lawyer. Hmm. For 100 bucks, with a consultation fee with one of our neighbors, we found that our uh, desperation for money was blinding us. <laughs> Never, he said, ever give anyone your bank account details. <laughs> Shortly after this embarrassing fiasco, the Vancouver lawyer called. She asked us how we were doing with the rewrite and then said that she had been approached by someone we might want to meet. His name was Joel Solomon, and he'd like to talk to us about New Society Publishers. Joel Solomon, I knew the name. The new Catalyst subscription list was very familiar to me. Even with 2,000 plus names, they all felt known to me. I looked him up, Joel Solomon from Tennessee and Cortez Island. We had few subscribers from Tennessee. His name stood out. We agreed to meet at Isadora's in Vancouver, on Isadora's restaurant on Granville Island. Isadora's was an employee-owned restaurant that had offered shares to investors when it, when, it, when it was getting up and running. FedUp had bought shares and passed them on to us. Dividends were paid in restaurant meals. It was a great scheme for us, and we used it many times. We met for lunch. We left at four. Joel turned our heads around. Yes, he said, 
I can probably find some donation money for you if you get your tax status sorted out. But, and here's the head turning bit, I could really help you out a lot more if you were a for-profit. Do keep an eye. The corporate world was the enemy. At the bottom of all the issues we had taken on in our work was capitalist greed. How could we possibly turn away from this point of view? It wasn't Joel's beautiful Tennessee drawl that convinced us. Not entirely, anyway. Was it our feeling of desperation? The more we talked, the more excited I became. I felt energized, and I couldn't quite understand why. We both felt the stirrings of empowerment as we began to enter the psychological space of the entrepreneur. Joel was launching Renewal Partners, a venture capital business with a big difference. He was acting on behalf of Carol Newell, a woman of wealth, who would years later receive the Order of Canada for her philanthropic and innovative business collaborations. Together, Joel and Carol were strategizing about investing her significant personal wealth in British Columbia's economy by partnering with businesses who, who were working with a triple bottom line, financial, social, and environmental success as the threefold objective. That is to say, not just profit for shareholders. New Society's publishers had the potential to fit the bill. I had had my head turned around before. I had once had the great honor of presenting with Thomas Berry, the radical and much-loved priest at the Catholic Retreat Center in Ontario. As if listening to Thomas talk about the great work and the dream of the earth from his spiritual cosmological point of view wasn't enough to shift a die-hard anti-religion person, here I met radical nuns whose work and very presence was awe-inspiring. To the point where I could imagine that if the Catholic Church could become a voice for environmental and social change, that this would provide an extremely powerful pivot for influencing huge numbers of people. Prior to this revelation, I had most definitely considered religion to be the opiate of the masses, and I would not consider that any cracks in my worldview were possible. Similarly, the idea that capitalism could have potential power as a game changer was not at all in my lexicon. Nevertheless, my head was once again turning. We took the plunge and formed a corporation and together with renewal partners, went to the business development bank, put our property on the line as collateral and got some more money. Making a bid to the Philadelphians for the entire list, the name, the ISBNs, the files, and everything but the kitchen sink, we made an offer that they couldn't refuse. Amazingly, we were up and running by the fall of 1996. We released our ecological footprint in the fall of that year, in spite of some fellow American travelers muttering that the notion of sustainability was just not something that the US people knew or cared about. But the Reese Wackernackle research showed that if everyone on the planet lived the North American lifestyle, we would need three more planets to draw on. Our unchecked ecological footprint was indeed a huge problem, like it or not. Many around the world agreed. We went on to sell foreign rights for this title to at least seven different, seven different foreign language publishers, and our English edition went to reprint many times despite its dated content and design and it still sells a couple of hundred copies a year, almost, almost 20 years later. But this is getting ahead of our story. There we were, with some money in the bank, not much. Two computers, one brand new. A fax machine, two desks, and a book packing table, just the two of us, full of nerves and determination. On our own, we hit the decks running. How to rebuild this business. New Society publishers in Philadelphia, based on the need for activist material for nonviolent social change, needed to be updated and brought into line with what Kip and I perceived to be the needs of activists in the late 90s. Our passionate interests of community, environmentalism, feminism, and bioregionalism, born of our own experiences, grew naturally and logically from the earlier NSP passions around the work of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, nonviolent direct action, feminism, and the peace movement. So it was no accident that our ecological footprint became a foundational book for the newly rising NSP Phoenix. Along with our own book, Home, a bioregional reader, Healing the Wounds and similar books, we were off to the races. The Philadelphians had passed on a few exceptional titles to us as well, The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making, and most notably, John Taylor Gatto's Dumbing Us Down. Initially, Kip and I made editorial decisions together, but he did all of the editor's work, acquisition, substantive, copy editing. 
He also did most of the page layout and proofing, and he designed a few ads that we did, as well as creating the direct mail pieces. I did all of the bookkeeping, and maintained the mailing list, processed book orders, and packed the books, and tried my darndest to learn Ventura, the page-making program that seemed totally opaque to me. I also liaised with sales reps and book distributors in both the US and Canada. Just prior to finalizing the deal with the Philadelphians, we had realized that we needed someone to give us a hand, at least to help pack up the book orders. Um, Julie had traveled in the early 90s for a couple of years, ending up in Australia, where she and her boyfriend, he's here too, um, for <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where they worked at a youth hostel. There she met Sue Customs, a young woman from Vancouver. They teamed up and had a few adventures, picking fruit and camping with crocodiles, but these adventures are beyond the scope of my story. Suffice to say that Sue and Julie became lifelong friends and Sue revealed her desire to get into book publishing. When they both returned to BC, the timing was perfect. We needed someone, and Sue applied. She was our only applicant. <laughs> <laughs> we hired her, and as luck would have it, she and her recently acquired husband moved to Gabriola. We only had part-time work for her four hours a week. She packed books, which is, to my mind, one of the best jobs in the company. Soon after hiring Sue, we hired her son, Will, also part-time. Neither of them knew much about book publishing, but like us, were excited by the prospect of learning the business. In the summer of 1997, they would both take the intensive two-week book publishing immersion course at SFU. Page design and typesetting had to be passed on to an expert. Greg Green eventually took on most of our books on a contract basis, and he was able to leave his job in Nanaimo. The marketing needed lots of help, so on the recommendation of our son and his friends, we hired one of their pals, Sarah Reeves. I'm sure we could literally feel the company growing. We had one telephone line and, in fact, one phone. Will answered it one day. Putting his hand over the receiver, he called across the room. Hey, Mom, if it's the White House, is it for you? <laughs> well, I thought he said the White Heart. <laughs> one of the local pu pubs, you know. Sure, I replied. It was Al Gore's office wanting several of our books. I think I became a little starry-eyed because I neglected to ask for a credit card number to pay for the perhaps six <laughs> titles. It seemed our authors and their books were getting some attention. Just prior to the Philadelphians closing their doors, we had negotiated a Canadian distribution arrangement with General Distribution Services in Mississauga. GDS was a division of Stoddard Publishing. In the US, we continued to be distributed by InBook, a consortium of, a consortium of independent book publishers. This was an arrangement put in by the, into place by the Philadelphians, and we were grateful for it. Along with sales reps, distributors are considered essential to getting books to booksellers. They are middlemen, taking though, and they take a substantial chunk from sales and charging for every single service. And the smaller you are, the more you pay per title for everything. We were slightly different in that we hand-sold our books through book tables at events and through direct mail. A publisher who sells their own books directly to readers is a strange anomaly to the traditional trade. But as an activist press, we knew we needed to be in touch with our readers and also with our potential authors. But how to play both sides of the territory? Keith and I decided to focus on the book trade, <clears throat> which we did almost as a component of our continuing education in the book publishing business. We went to Book Expo America, Book Expo Canada, the American Library Association's annual trade show and conference, regional trade fairs and library shows, the London Book Fair, and even the Frankfurt International Book Fair. The Frankfurt Book Fair has seven pavilions, each with up to three floors. We were located in the Canada stand. All of the Canadian publishers and their exhibits and temporary office spaces taking up about one quarter of one aisle in one pavilion. The number of new books represented at this fair is unfathomable. How do we manage to sell anything, given the vast quantities of publications each and every year? The glitz and glamour, the swag and the schmoozing never seem to end. It's a constant buzz. Book Expo America is much the same. And though, of course, it's smaller than the Frankfurt International Book Fair, it's still huge. Usually in New York, it's expensive. We felt like we were constantly spending large amounts of money in the hope that booksellers would notice us. We made swag, stuff we all get. 
for one book, Divorce Your Car by Katie Elvord, we made little buttons featuring the book's name. I brazenly foisted them on, on a group of libra librarians at, uh, at, at an uh, American Library Association's conference and trade show, only to be met with, why would I want to do that? I love my car. <laughs> we were most definitely not preaching to the choir. <laughs> this exchange was a red flag, though we didn't realize it at the time. After a few years of trade shows, we grew cynical. Booksellers were rapidly closing their doors due to the brutal incursion of the big box stores, including Walmart, Costco, and other unlikely book dealers. We continued with Book Expo America, BEA, for a few years, and we did receive some attention. I was awarded Woman Publisher of the Year from a trade journal, but after ten, the tens of thousands of dollars and the annoying, almost celebrity star atmosphere, we reached a point where we'd had enough. We wanted to meet the choir. Partnering with Co-op America, we were amongst the first exhibitors at the Green Festival in San Francisco. The Green Festival was a project of Co-op America and Global Exchange. We were given a fantastic location, right in the center of the hall. Everyone had to walk right past us, and they did. Nearly 20,000 people over the course of the Friday to Sunday event. We sold hundreds of books, and many of our authors gave talks and met their readers. Music, good food, endless talk, this was more like it. We met so many interesting, like-minded, and kind people. Eric Henry of TS Design stands out. I will never forget meeting him in a colossal downpour in San Francisco at our very first Green Festival. We were getting out of the taxi in front of the hotel in what seemed like the middle of the street. Huge dripping display cases and suitcases and ourselves trying to pay the driver, all of a bit of a panic-stricken gong show. Eric comes running across the street, can I help you? And he did, carting our gear with us following into the hotel. He became a good friend even coming to visit us on Gabriel Island, and most recently, we have signed him for a book project. His company, TS Designs, is a clothing manufacturer specializing in cotton t-shirts uh, from North Carolina. Uh, and his activism is using American-made fabric and American workers in the shop. More than this, he powers all his company vehicles with biodiesel. We met up with Eric, not just at green festivals, but at many other alternative big events in the US. The Green Festival organizers expanded their uh, project from Austin, Texas to Chicago to New York. We partnered with the organizers and sponsored the events, attending all of them for a few years. At one of these events, David Suzuki was a keynote speaker. Sometimes something somebody says gets under your skin. He said it almost offhandedly, but it made me think uh, for some time after he made the comment. He said while thumbing through our books at our table and ga gazing around the, the conference hall, he said, hmm, still seems like a lot of consuming going on around here. <laughs> Casting a new light on the event, I knew he was right. Were we all trying to green shop our way out of the eco-footprint problem? Green festivals weren't the only events we went to. The Midwest Renewable Energy Fair in Custer, Wisconsin, held in a field in a few barns, was a favorite for years. Here was an event that, again, annually drew about 14,000 people, many camping for the weekend. Meeting these folks really helped grow the business. We met up with current authors and acquired several others. And Soul Fest in Northern California was another wonderful experience. This event in its heyday it drew well over 10,000 people, completely powered by solar arrays, completely off-grid, with many demonstration sites. This was a celebration of the alternative culture. Our location, three long tables, was right alongside the main stage. It doesn't get any better. On Saturday night, there was live music and a dance band, and of course, it was hot and dry. We sold books, drank beer, and danced under the stars. People left joints on our table. We were, after all, in the middle of Humboldt County. <laughs> to develop new categories of books, we attended those kinds of events. For example, the US Green Building Council's annual trade show and conference. Not exactly an alternative uh, event like Soul Fest and Green Festival, but our hunch was that green building interests would cross over into natural building and renewable energy. We met many of the key players, and aside from the bookstore on site, books and book publishers were not represented at all. The field was wide open for us. We signed Alex Wilson, David Johnson, and Jerry Udelson, and a few others before the big publishers took notice of what was happening. 
By the second year, Taunton and others were sidling up to our table asking us how we did it. At one of the last USGBC events that we went to, we were featuring Athena Thompson's Homes That Heal in the vast trade show hall in Portland, Oregon, when Athena actually collapsed and I too felt ill. The place was so toxic from all the show infrastructure, the temporary carpeting especially, and much of the green building project, pro projects produced air quality that smelled like a chemical factory. I think we went to one more after that in Atlanta, and then green building actually became much less attractive to us. We preferred natural building and still do, though we had learned a lot. Somewhere along the line, we met Gifford and Libba Pinchot from Bainbridge Island. They are a dedicated team of green business educators and consultants, as well as being active local participants in environmental issues. I mention them because Libba, possibly unknown to her, was a significant influence in our thinking about how to run our business. More accurately, her thinking affirmed much of our own gut feelings about our relationship to staff. The Philadelphians had been a diehard consensus decision-making collectively organized group of radicals. We thought that this may have contributed at least partially to their demise, at least partly because there was no accountability built into their structure. Kip and I had also been involved in several groups and organizations where decisions were made collectively, and while we wholeheartedly agreed in theory, um, in practice, we also knew that it was very difficult to achieve and maybe not always the way to go. Our thinking with our version of New Society Publishers that we would have a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we owned now and in the foreseeable future was backing New Society Publishers and we were treading very carefully indeed. Libba said, if you can't hire family, make them family. This is just what we were doing. Right from the beginning, we knew we wanted to work in a company ourselves that was internally sustainable and that our long-term viability was more important than a stout bottom line. And we had spent enough time living in community to know that caring for each other on a daily basis provided real security. Perhaps the most important policy we've ever created was that of family first. If your child is ill, of course you stay home. If your father passes away, of course, you take the time you need to heal, deal with the loss. There have rarely been any questions around any of our staff's ability to take the time they need to care for their lives at home. We offer six weeks paid holidays a year, plus 10 days at winter solstice. Most people have the option of working some of the week in, at their home offices, and as soon as we could afford it, we offered an extended medical package. After, several, after successful years, we gave employees generous after-tax bonuses. By 2006, New Society Publishers was flourishing. The state of the world was, however, ominous. George W. Bush reigned in the US. The subject of peak oil was at the top of the charts as far as our book sales were concerned. Richard Heinberg's message began to resonate. He argued that we had to power down and get ready for a worldwide shortage of oil, that dark substance that fuels our economy, that in turn pollutes the atmosphere, that fuel and enables our society to enrich the 1% and impoverish most of the world's population, while simultaneously disrupting the delicate balance of ecosystems everywhere. We cynically would mutter under our breath that the worse things got, the more books we sold. <laughs> People came up to our book table often, uh, saying over and over again that they wanted every book on the table, and they, often brought, they were often brought to tears with their own despair at the state of things. It turned out to be a very good move on our part to turn towards our own readers and authors. All around us, the book business was changing. People imagined book publishing to be an almost leisurely intellectual business. This may have been true 100 years ago, but today we are a media company in a highly aggressive and competitive capitalist context. From the late 90s on, small bookstores were being consumed by big box stores at an alarming rate. Big box stores, in turn, were gouging the publishers, demanding deep discounts because of their large orders. The new practice of ordering, ordering hundreds of copies or thousands of a title, I believe, was to fill the shelves of warehouse-sized stores, i.e. to paper the walls with our product. Practices of displaying books, like facing the covers out rather than spine out, uh, or placing the books at the end of shelves, all were services being charged back to the publishers. In days gone by, booksellers organized their stock according to the tastes of their customers. 
Now the publishers had to pay to pay notice at every turn. Most new books don't sell huge stocks. We all knew what was coming. Returns, truckloads, indeed trainloads in some cases, of books would come back to us sometimes just thrown in boxes with no packing. And we were charged for processing the returns for the shipping. In fact, we paid to ship the books to them in the first place, paid to have them sent free to customers, and then paid shipping to get them back again. Just as the big box store invoice was due, we would be hit by returns. Another nightmare scenario that publishers have to deal with is reprinting. All the inventory from a title has been bought, that is to say it's sitting in a big box store or worse, their warehouse, and we have no stock. The book needs to be reprinted because our warehouse is empty and there is demand from wholesalers, etc. The reality often is that just as the reprint rolls off press, the big box store will return their stock of the title, sending cases of the same title back to us. It's an easy way for them to pay their bill. We've seen them return and reorder almost days later. Publishers have tried to deal with the archaic practice of returns. Originally, book publishers were gentlemen of wealth and offered the return policy to booksellers so that booksellers could try out the new work. Now we can't get rid of this abusive system. As individual businesses, we could decide to simply not accept returns. We would most likely not sell any books to the likes of chapters, who are often now the only store in town. This is a risk that our authors would not accept. As a consortium of publishers, we are not legally allowed to organize to collectively resist this practice. We would be seen to be colluding, and of course, that's illegal. Most publishers do not sell directly to booksellers, only the huge and mighty, who themselves are owned by the super high and mighty. Independent publishers have distributors. As mentioned earlier, we were originally distributed by General Distribution Services, the division of Stoddard in Canada and InBook in the US. In the late 90s, GDS and Stoddard fell into financial chaos. Almost simultaneously, so did InBook. Fortunately, at InBook, we had an agreement that allowed us to get our books out of the warehouse before the place was locked down by the creditors. With most of our stock in the US, we narrowly escaped the financial ruin that befell many other small presses. We lost some books and money on the GDS fall, but nothing like some of the larger Canadian houses did. It was a dark time. We managed to reorganize ourselves for the better in the end. We took on our own Canadian distribution and moved to consortium, a seemingly solid company in the US. We really liked doing our own distribution in Canada and it grew nicely. Julie took it on in 1998 and started uh, starting originally out of her basement. When they moved to a larger house, what was originally the garage, <laughs> turned into a book packing plant. Uh, soon we had to rent storage space as well. Invoices came from our, invoice, uh, from our office on Gabriola to her fax machine or computer in Nanaimo during the day and in the evening. Several women from the neighborhood showed up to pack books. It was a very efficient and happy situation. We liked being directly in touch with the booksellers too. And there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a pallet or several pallets of well-packed boxes of books being picked up in the morning by Canada Post only because Julie was so well organized did the system work. It was marginal though. She lives in a residential neighborhood and between deliveries and pickups, we knew we were pushing the limits of local bylaws. We had narrowly escaped the devastating con consequences of the middleman downfall. And we were, felt we were doing our job of providing tools for building a new society. But by 2006, Kip and I were growing weary and really wanted to put some of these tools into practice in our own lives. How to move on personally became a question that surfaced over and over again for us. We researched it, how to sell a publishing company, who to sell it to. The graying of the publishing business is a serious question in Canada with so many of the original publishers um, nearing retirement age. We had no answers and the more we thought about it, the fewer avenues we could find. In May of that year, Kip and I set up the book table at the World Urban Forum in Vancouver. Delegates came from Cuba, Africa, Holland, Australia, Germany, China, Japan, everywhere imaginable. It was an amazing event, and our table was right outside the conference hall. The event was five days long, and every night we had to request that more books be sent to us from our Nanaimo warehouse as we sold out daily. I think we sent about $20,000 worth of books around the world as a consequence. But it was here that I noticed that Kip couldn't write legibly on the credit card slips, and he grew very tired in the afternoons. A few weeks later, 
Our doc sent him to see a neurologist in Victoria. It was Parkinson's disease, and though his health, health would worsen, we were told it was unlikely that he would die from it. It was more likely he would die with it. This was the tipping point for us as our lives began inexorably to take a turn toward a change that would make everything different. It took two years until 2008 to first firmly decide to let go of New Society Publishers and then agree to sell to Douglas and McIntyre, an established mid-sized BC book publisher. If it hadn't have been for Kip's health, we probably would have procrastinated and not given in to DNM's long courtship but we felt we had to turn our energy towards Kip's Parkinson's disease, this new elephant in the living room, giving it the same dedicated energy that we had given to New Society publishers. On a glorious day in September of that year, the deal having been finalized a few weeks prior, all of the DNM staff and their partners arrived at our home office on Gabriola to celebrate the coming together of the three imprints. Douglas and McIntyre, Greystone, and New Society Publishers. It was a day filled with optimism for most of us and for and relief for Kip and I. After the sale, I agreed to stay on as publisher with Kip taking less and less of an active role. We shut down our Canadian center in the distribution center in Nanaimo and moved our inventory to HarperCollins, taking advantage of the favorable terms offered by HC because of the combined sales levels of the three imprints. We didn't like letting go of our direct relationship with booksellers in the happy Nanaimo warehouse scene, but we felt that we were now in cahoots with a major Canadian book publisher who knew the subtle details of the business better than we did, had better contacts in the industry and media in Canada, and the decisions like bunking in with HarperCollins would only make us appear to be more professional. We were warned by our accountant and lawyer, however, was that DNM were essentially buying our company with our own money. Not quite understanding this, we moved forward, convinced that this arrangement would help to streamline our operations, that we would collaborate with DNM's team, and that all in all, NSP would be able to move successfully into the mainstream. At the first management meeting that Kip and I attended with DNM's upper level team, including past and present owners in their boardroom, we presented our forthcoming list of titles. We don't need or want to see this, they said. Later, the head of the firm said to me on the phone that he didn't care what we did, as long as we were happy. Meanwhile, our bookkeeper was constantly distressed as every extra cent from our bank account was sent to head office. Kip and I were disappointed, to say the least, but we carried on, always keeping a separate set of, of books with an audited financial statement every year. We knew that NSP was holding its own. DNM didn't, didn't interfere one way or another, and we did publish what we wanted to. It was 2008, and the financial world was in crisis. Shouldn't we be strategizing for the coming serious collapse of the world economy, we urged our parent company? After all, we had recently published several titles that laid out the downfall of world markets coupled with climate change and other environmental issues. These titles included Gardening When It Counts by Steve Solomon, The Party's Over, and Power Down, both by Richard Heinberg, and the damning and controversial Crossing the Rubicon by Mike Rupert, all leading to hardship and suffering for many, many people. These and many other books published by us and other publishers all pointed to the fact that society was indeed crumbling and that the consequences would be de devastating. Gardening with accounts, for example, was selling 250 copies a week on Amazon alone. People were taking the news to heart and the situation into their own and their community's hands. But DNM just kept on overstating their sales and ours and borrowing from the banks. And there was nothing we could do about it but carry on with our work. Couldn't you be a bit more optimistic, said DNM CFO, about my projections for the coming year? We knew our industry would be taking a hit, and we didn't know if we should batten down the hatches or go with the theory that the worse things got, the greater our sales, the latter strategy seeming just a little arrogant. Bookstores were closing faster than ever, and those that remained, even the big box superstores, were ordering less. People just weren't buying like they used to. This was understandable, given the soaring unemployment and foreclosure rates. And then it happened. Chapters Indigo started closing stores. DNM sold most of their books in Canada. And with the loss of the independent booksellers, losing the Chapters Indigo stores was disastrous. When returns outnumber sales, 
any book publisher can hang on for only so long. Print bills, the banks, authors, all were breathing down DNM's neck. Truckloads of books were being sent back, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Up against the wall, DNM finally was forced into a corner and had to declare insolvency. Our little company, along with the DNM and Greystone imprints, were locked down by the bank. All of this was slowly revealed to us. We knew something was seriously wrong when our longtime allies at Friesen's, our colleagues in so many ways, suddenly pushed all our print dates ahead. In other words, they refused to print anything that wasn't prepaid. In our business, this is almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible. And though we managed to get some of our reprints and front list to press, others had to wait in limbo. That was August 2012. Staff were walking into work like hangdogs. Morale, always robust, had plummeted to an all-time low. Kip and I knew, <clears throat> Kip and I knew a little, little more than they did, but, not, but just enough to know that we had no answers and that the future of NSP was in danger. Rob Sanders, publisher at Greystone, had taken on the publisher role from me in mid-2011 when I had decided that I really needed to be at home. He was caught between a rock and a hard place. He had spent decades building Greystone into what it had become, a publisher of fine books, some environmentally oriented through his relationship with the David Suzuki Foundation and many award-winning titles, a savvy publisher and an all-round nice guy. We had felt that he could relieve me while simultaneously looking for someone to take up the the leadership reins at NSP. During the bankruptcy process, he was privy to more information than we were, but not all of it. It was a fearful place for both Rob and ourselves, because we knew the banks were looking for a bottom feeder, a company that would buy the business for pennies, let go of the staff, and sell off the inventory at bargain prices. A sale to a bottom feeder would be the end of New Society Publishers, the end of a long legacy of activist work and another nail in the coffin for one of Canada's few, some would say only, politically alternative press. It was at this point that I realized that we had taken on New Society Publishers from the Philadelphians as an act of trust. When they handed over the business to us, we were receiving a legacy of work that had, from the very outset, the struggles it represented the struggles of resistance to colonization, to war, to patriarchy, to violence, and whose books gave people the tools to resist nonviolently and the strategies to reorganize. New Society Publishers' engagement with this work was and is a real part of the long story of freedom. We were holding in trust the work of past and present activists and authors, and we knew that we must survive to publish the work of future generations of activists. And, re and, and readers. In the conglomerating capitalist world where the bottom line is the measure of all things, what we tenuously held was much, much bigger than any one of us, that, than even the professional lives of Kip and I and our staff. For if not an independent, vision-driven, passionate organization like New Society, then who would be deciding what would make it to press and what wouldn't, and on what grounds would those decisions be made? The answer to that question was clear as the sharks circled. By January, we had at the most two weeks. It was going to be a done deal. The banks don't care about the history of freedom or of resistance to the man. They wanted money as much as they could get. Whoever could pay the most would win. NSP staff and ourselves pulled out all the stops. So-and-so's mother could come up with some money. Uh, maybe some, someone could get a, a bank loan. Maybe we could come up with a few hundred thousand. But in two weeks? How can we possibly come up with a structure that would give us the confidence to put this much money forward? One night, Julie, now, now the chief operating officer, stayed late, desperately trying to draft an agreement that would work for everybody. I found her in tears at her desk. That was it. I knew in an instant what had to be done. Kip and I had to dig into our retirement money and do everything we could to buy the company back. It was as clear as the bell to me that this was the way to go. Once again, we were charged up just as we had been years ago at Isadora's. The next day, I called Joel Solomon. Unbeknownst to me, Carol and Joel and their colleagues had also been wondering what could be done about the situation. So my call sparked the conversation of once again partnering with Renewal. Within hours, Carol Newell was on board. When a decision is the right one, things start to fall into place like dominoes. 
We had to tread carefully. We could not fail. Dealing with the bank's brokers was frightening, but we were brave, all of us. And we got it back. Traumatized, we took stock. We had no money, but we did have some prepaid print bills. <laughs> <laughs> we, had a, we had a front list and a catalog, and no one had missed a day's pay. Our team was energized, and we were back in business with hardly a hiccup to the outside world. And that was about 21 months ago. And that's the end of my tale. Um, Julie has written um, the conclusion to this, which I, I'm going to deliver for her. So this is by Julie. A business in transition is an amazing thing. Within a span of two years, we found ourselves moving from the unsettled, dark and gloomy days of a fairly significant bankruptcy to holding the future in our hands. Although at times, over the last couple of years, it felt like doors were closing all around us, really, they were opening. And with the buyback of New Society Publishers in February of 2013, an amazing opportunity slowly began to unfold. The rest of 2013 was spent in recovery, regrouping and taking stock. We considered the future of NSP and Carol graciously stepped back and allowed us to ponder what was going to be next. We slowly got our feet back on the ground and I couldn't help but feel that this long transition the company seemed to be stuck in was coming to an end. We were back in a secure financial position with owners who were encouraging a new business structure and forward thinking. The staff contemplated various ownership strategies, but to be honest, the depth of knowledge required to understand the detailed intricacies of business was not the forte of any of us, and the day-to-day -day work of a publishing house was all-consuming. Although we all knew change was in the air and ideas came and went, we had no idea what the future would look like. During the time of hardship a couple of years ago, I had a mantra. The business felt like the little engine that could chugging up a very steep hill, and I would tell myself to just keep going, move up that hill, if only by an inch at a time, but just don't let it slip back. We could do it, I told myself, and we did. Since February of 23, the words in my head have changed, we can be more. We can do something better with this business, something amazing. We are already pretty good at being a mindful business, but a door had opened, and this was our chance to make a change. Be more, be better, we can do it, but how? In the early summer of this year, the shareholders dedicated themselves to the goal of creating a model that took sustainable ethical and moral principles, business principles into consideration. After an exciting meeting with some of the wisest people I have ever had the privilege to meet, we came up with a plan, an exciting plan, a different plan that is the beginning of making a huge difference. On September 22nd of this year, the shareholders presented the draft of a new shareholders agreement that now included an employee ownership strategy. The agreement offered employees a stake in the company through a trust. Suddenly, in the living room of my parents' house, staff members realized we were being offered ownership in the company. Not just a paying dividend, but a trust to be managed by employees in a position on the board of directors with a very strong and active role in the direction of the company. The future was being placed in the hands of the people who had poured their blood, sweat, and yes, tears into the company. The feeling was amazing. Staff lingered at the house long after working hours. The dry erase board was covered with the criteria and positions available for both the trust and the company's board of directors. The wheels are definitely in motion. Ownership of a business, what is that anyhow? As my mom mentioned earlier, my parents both saw themselves as holding the company in trust. In those early days when it moved on to a little Gulf Island in BC, they carried it into the next chapter of its life. They loved, cared for, and nurtured this company and have done so for many years, allowing it to be successful, meaningful, and shared by so many people. Now and for future years, alongside of them are all the dedicated and passionate staff who are committed to the mission of the company and being the little company that does. It's not just providing the tools for a world of change, but is in itself a tool for change, de dedicated to helping you walk the talk while it too walks the talk. That's the plan. We are so excited to be starting this new chapter. Publishing these days is a crazy mix-up industry in an even crazier world, but we are one hell of a company. Wait until you see our next season. Oh, and please, touch the books. <laughs> they may even change your life like they have all of ours. Thank you. <laughs>